and present to the movement of the Spirit in our service, our service of worship and work to God. God has already accomplished a mighty and magnificent gift in our life, the gift of the gospel, of hope and grace and love. I pray that in the softness of our spirit that we may be willing to accept this gift and welcome it with all we have, with our heart and our minds, our very beings. For there is no gift greater than God's love and peace. May the holy peace of Christ be with you all. As brothers and sisters in Christ, let us rise and share that blessed peace of Christ one with another. power of your spirit, O Lord, make your word become a joy to us and the delight of our hearts. Amen. The Psalter reading this morning is Psalm 26, verses 1 through 8, um, if the congregation would read the bold text. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. Test my heart and mind. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord. and telling all your wondrous deeds. Let us turn now to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. And let us listen for God's word for us today. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? What will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, if last week we reflected on Peter's confession, 
This week is certainly Peter's digression. He not only just quickly gets the keys to the kingdom, newly minted with the fresh smell of keys still on them, and he already feels like he somehow has to take control of even the Son of God himself. There is nothing like a little bit of power to corrupt. Now, I'm sure Peter had all the best intentions. Okay, you put me in charge of the church, Jesus. You know, I have some authority here, right? If, you let, if I can lose things and I can do things, maybe I can make a better story for you, Jesus. I could just see Jesus going like, Peter, you don't get it. When he says, get behind me, it's a sense of like, get in line. Get your priorities right. And the truth is, is that we are never in a position to tell God what to do. We are never in a position to tell Christ what his ministry should be about. We, should ne we are never in that position of authority. That's not where our authority lies. But I think part of what's behind Peter's fear, not only that he does not want to see his good friend suffer, But if this is how it goes down for Jesus, how, Peter might think, does it go down for the rest of us? And I think that would be a tough sell. Sure, come and join a church, follow this Savior, and lay down your life, by the way. Give of yourselves and put God first and the world second, that world which you have your own fears about how you're going to make it day by day. But Jesus doesn't back off from that. And I think it's for a very good spiritual reason for us. And that's what I'd like for us to think about and reflect on for today. That idea of denying ourselves... In a great sense, it's that sense of perseverance. Because when things don't go well in our lives, oh, so many times I've heard people say that they just can't abide it. If this is what it's going to be like, they're not interested. If God can't answer a prayer the way I want him to, well, then how could he possibly be God? And they walk away. That's not faith. It'd be much easier for me to stand up here, and I know some preachers do, and promise a life of glory and perfection. If you pray hard enough, you know, God wants you to have that Lamborghini, and he wants you to have those riches, and he wants to have, you know, that whole gospel of prosperity. But as I've said from this pulpit before, that would be a lie. And I never want to lie, especially standing here. So it's a harder word to offer, but a much truer one. And I think one that probably resonates with your life even more profoundly. The idea of persevering in our life of faith because Jesus says that at the end, he will make all things right. He will repay everyone for what has been done. This is not in a negative sense. This is in a positive sense. He says he watches what we all are doing in our ministries and in our lives, the way we live our life, the truth that we truly embrace and live into. And all of that, though we might forget the things that we do, God never forgets. I was reminded of this yesterday. I was having coffee with someone I hadn't seen in oh, quite a while anyway. We'd been friends and kind of fallen away a little bit, and they wanted to get together again. And anyway, in the course, the course of the conversation, she was saying, do you remember that conversation we had how many years ago? Yikes. Um, no. <laughs> no, I didn't remember. I'm afraid my memory is not that great. 
And then she recounted this conversation that was supposed to be very meaningful for our friendship and for ministry and all the kinds of stuff going forward. You know, sometimes people remember things we forget. Sometimes we offer things to people we, we don't think much of. A caring call, a card, a telephone call, a friendship. And we don't think as much about it, but we don't know how it is being received and how powerful that can be. And sometimes that can be just the thing that somebody holds on to for so long that helps them to persevere. But why is it in our life of discipleship why do we have to have this lesson of perseverance? What is it that is so important that God himself endured it and calls us to do the same? In our lives, what we want, if the world dictated it to us, we would want healing right away. Deliverance. We want guidance, moment by moment, and Lord, don't make me wait. But there is something that happens to our soul when we have to endure difficult times. It is though, like a plow in the earth, it just goes so deep. And though it might be painful, and though it might cleave our very soul, yet within that, a seeds are planted of a blessing and a life that God is calling us into. And it takes a long time to grow a soul. A doctor must study for seven to ten years before they can realize their goal. A parent must teach their child the same lesson repeatedly, over and over and over again. Most of us work hard and save our money for a long period of time before we can have something that is important to us. And the spirit-filled Christian must learn the secret of perseverance if a Christ-like character is to be developed within them. People often speak of the patience of Job. Job suffering long and waited patiently upon the Lord before he received healing and the restoration of his family and his possessions. Moses spent 40 years in the school of patience before he received his potent, reached his potential and usefulness for the Lord. We are advised to be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near, we are told in James 5, 8. And the development of patience, which is often interpreted as perseverance as well, is an important part of our becoming like Christ. We can read that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. The word that we get in the New Testament for perseverance in the Greek is epimenai, persistence, insistence, tenacity, stubbornness, or tenaciousness. There's a quote that, unfortunately, they were not, they did not um, ascribe it to a particular person. I do not take credit, but I like this phrase. Someone has said that this patience or this perseverance is love, patiently waiting, even in suffering. I think I have seen that most profoundly in people who have gone through difficult times. There is a depth to their character and their soul that you do not find in others. But it has come at a great price in their own life. But what a blessing it is not only to them, but to other people. No one goes through this life without some measure of suffering. It is a part of the nature of our being human, part of our nature of being in this world. Trials are the discipline of a loving Heavenly Father who wants us to share in His holiness. So we are called upon as disciples to endure this hardship as a discipline. For God is treating us as His children, heirs of the kingdom, promised heirs of love. The hardships that the disciples endured, that the apostles endured, was more extreme than hopefully any of us will have to endure. 
But yet in so doing, Christ's love and truth was revealed in their lives and proclaimed for generations yet to come. It is said that a young plant that is bent back and forwards by the wind develops strong and deep roots. Sometimes in our lives we have this opposing force, these things, these challenges that we face, but as we endure them faithfully in Christ, our roots go deeper and deeper and deeper. And the strongest storms do not overcome. Many scriptures reveal that to follow Christ includes this cross. In 1 Peter, the apostle wrote, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. But it is hard. I think it's difficult in the midst of the night when we're preparing so much. And we ask, Lord, how long? I don't know if I can endure And yet in our faithful prayer, we might hear the words, of course you can't, because I'm there with you to carry the burden. It is a way for us to open our hearts before God in all sincerity and honesty and brutalness of life. When we can pray before our God with tears streaming down our face, Lord, I trust in you. Know that great things are happening in your life and in your soul. Jesus suffered at the hands of a pagan pilot and an angry crowd from outside world. But he also suffered as a result of unfaithful Judas on the inside. Whether we are required to learn this perseverance by trials in the world or within our own fellowship, Jesus remains our example. When he was tempted by Satan, he rejected the idea of a throne without a cross because it would be empty. In Romans 5, patience or perseverance, joy and hope are grouped together. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. These verses show the progression of Christian development and maturity through suffering and patience, leading to hope. It is not too difficult to wait and hope when things seem to be working out, but when nothing seems to be happening to relieve the suffering, the natural reaction is to feel despair and hopelessness. But if we are persistent in our faith and abiding in God's love and his truth, he will see us through. Through perseverance, I believe we gain wisdom, an ability to remain tempered during a crisis, and it opens us to the grace of forgiveness. Sometimes the lessons we learn are not only for ourselves, they are for others as well. And they persist. Yesterday, after doing a whole bunch of different things and working on sermon and whatever, I walked over to the couch and I said, oh, five minutes, I'm just going to turn on the TV and I'm going to have some lemonade and I'm just going to relax. And the phone rings, and it's my neighbor from next door whose husband has dementia. And she says, Lynn, are you home? Yes, I'm home. Bill has been missing for two hours. I can't find him. She was desperate. She had no car to drive around. The kids had taken the car away because Bill was convinced he could still drive. The last phone call that she had received was him being lost, and he said, I don't know where I am. So she said, would you go find him? Certainly. I grab my purse, I jump in the car, I start driving around. I cost walkers along the way, have you seen this man, you know? Why don't you just call the police? Well, because the wife doesn't want me to, and I understand why. I eventually found Bill on a park bench, had no clue that he had been missing for so long. 
smiled and offered me a Reese's peanut butter cup, which I was really tempted to take. But I said, would you like to get in the car? I just happened to see you and I thought you might like a ride home. Certainly, he said, that's very nice of you. And he got in the car. And I had his wife on the phone. I said, I found him, I found him, he's okay. Like any good wife, she yelled at him. She yelled at him when I dropped him off. She yelled at him as they were walking into the house. But I knew that that was fear and love. I don't know if I could have done all of that with the patients if I hadn't experienced George. The difference is I did not yell at George like that. I don't think we can yell at people with dementia, but the truth is I think Felicia has some too. The lessons we learn in our life are not only for ourselves, they are for others. And they teach us how to shine Christ's light. To be the one that she felt she could call in the midst of an emergency, I thought was a gift. To have confidence that I would find and deliver her husband home well, I was profound. I really didn't know where he had gone. Our God is very patient. And perhaps that's why we need to learn patience as well. The Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Over and over we hear in the Bible stories of God's peace, forgiveness, patience, and perseverance with us. He calls us to be just the same. Patience and perseverance, I think, is one of the wondrous gifts of the Holy Spirit. It operates outwardly towards our fellow human beings and inwardly, I think, towards ourselves, at least I hope, mainly when we are under trial. To persevere is a call to be reminded how deeply loved we truly are, that God recognizes the trials that we are called to endure, that he knows that it's hard for us, and he comes alongside of us to walk with us, even in the darkest of nights when we feel that he has left us, he is there with us. This gift of perseverance helps us to run the race that we are called to run, to live the life of faithful disciples that we are called to be. In Hebrews chapter 6, we read, for it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away since on their own they are crucifying again the Son of God and are holding him up to contempt. In other words, he's saying, for those who have a faith and walk away, at least here in Hebrews, he says, it's impossible to restore again to repentance. Ground that drinks up the rain, falling on it repeatedly, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and on the verge of being cursed. Its end is to be burned over. Even though we speak in this way, beloved, we are confident of better things in your case, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not overlook your work and the love that you showed for his sake in serving the saints, as you still do. And we want each, of, each one of you to show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end, so that you may not become sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. This is what Jesus is saying to Peter. 
This is what he's saying. Have an eternal perspective in mind that is grounded and surrounded by God's love and his peace and his hope. Hold on to that truth even in the darkest of days, even as you struggle with issues for years. Do not lose faith, for all of it will be marked to your benefit in the age to come. We live in a, a lifeline of eternity, not just of this life. We are not defined by this world, but we are defined by God's love and his truth. And it takes hard work to live into that truth sometimes. It would be wrong of me to say otherwise, but yet we do it not that we are crushed in our spirits. We do it because we have a promise that we hold on to that truly is eternal and is something that is solid that we can grasp. Even in the darkest of nights when tears might be strolling down our face, we know that God's love is with us. He will not abandon us because he is God, and only in him will we find our truth and our salvation. As Paul had cried after he had been blind, he said, But where, God, would I go if it was not to you? There is no other place to find this truth, no other foundation upon which to build our lives. This is why Jesus is so so adamant with Peter. And this is what defines the church community as well. Be kind to each other and to everyone else, we read in 1 Thessalonians. That means being patient. In other words, persevering with each member of our family, with our church family, and with every person we encounter every day of our lives. In our own nature, this would be impossible, but when the nature of God is being perfected in us by the Holy Spirit, we can be patient with everyone. And in Colossians, we read, and I close, For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. All glory be to God, and let us give thanks that God has called us as disciples of Christ to follow in his way, that we might grow and be the disciples that he calls us to be, that this world may be overturned, and that we may glory and bask in his eternal kingdom forever and ever. Amen.
let us remain standing as together we proclaim our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Our pastor has preached that we are never in a position to tell God what to do. Uh, standing before you as someone who is truly guilty of that. But thanks be to God for grace and mercy. But one of the things that we are in a position to tell God, to, and that is to tell God how thankful we are for his goodness and mercy, for his blessings, and for his love. Let us now tell God that as we prepare for our offering.
We thank the Summer Choir for that selection. For those of you who are able, would you please stand to your feet as we now receive our offering. and holy, loving and merciful God. Lord, we stand in adoration of all of who you are, but more importantly, who you are to us. Lord, we are thankful for your goodness and mercy, for your blessings and for your love. Receive now this offering. We ask that you would bless it, multiply it, allow this church to utilize it for the further building of your kingdom on this side of glory. And when it is all said and done, we will be forever mindful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise that it is due. It is in the mighty name of Jesus, your children pray. Amen. A few announcements for today. Uh, Wendy Reed is celebrating a milestone birthday. Um, I'm not to mention that she turns 70, so I won't mention that to anybody. We wish her a happy birthday and happen to see her. Our office will be closed tomorrow in recognition of Labor Day. And so if you're planning on coming down, don't. That's the short of it. Next Sunday, we're having a light brunch for those interested in finding out more about this church. This is for folks who might consider membership or just would like to find out a little bit more about Crescent. We're going to meet here in the sanctuary um, after church. So we'll gather up here, we'll do a tour, and then we'll go and we'll have a great time of um, sharing so we can learn more about you and you can learn a little bit more about us. We have an anniversary celebrating this month. Darcella has been with us for five years. This is her five year mark. Remember when she came into my office a little nervous and with trepidation, you know, wondering if she wanted to be, you know, part and, and here she is. And I'll tell you, you certainly have flourished in your ministry. So thank you, Darcella. Oh, uh, we can wish our American flag a happy birthday today. Uh, it first flew on September 3rd in 1777, so when we see the flag over Labor Day, um, yeah, she's just that old. She's a grand old flag. We have some foodstuffs. We were uh, gifted with a donation of food that we cannot use for our Tuesday lunch, and so Kevin has offered it to the congregation. So if you are interested, it's in the refrigerator. Um, it includes... Uh, Spinach, mixed greens, kale, peaches, which I understand are phenomenal, tomatoes, ready-to-eat salads, and wraps. So please help us out and take it home and have a little nosh. Are there any other announcements? Oh, yeah, how could I forget? I wanted to thank the Summer Choir. You guys have done an amazing job this season, and we just wanted to thank you so much because you've brought so much to our worship. So can we give them a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know there will be no summer choir next week, our loss, but on um, the 17th, the regular choir begins. So we look forward to having the regular choir as well, but thank you, summer choir. Uh, your voices have been wonderful. Are there any other announcements for the good of the congregation? Then let us go to the Lord's table. We come to our Savior's table, hungry for his presence, his grace, 
his forgiveness. If you can think of the best homecoming meal that you've ever been a part of, or you have welcomed and felt welcome to be home once again, the feeling of being loved, this would be it. Because our Savior's table is a table that we share together as disciples in Christ, loved by him and called to love in his name. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God, for they will come from the east and the west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. You bring forth bread from the earth and create the fruit of the vine. You made us in your image and freed us from the bonds of slavery. You claimed us as your people and made a covenant to be our God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey. When we forgot you and our faith was weak, you spoke through prophets, calling us to turn again to your ways. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with the celestial choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. And blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to deliver us from the bondage of death and slavery to sin. In humility, he descends from your heights to kneel in obedience to love's commands. He who is boundless takes on the bondage of our sin. He who is free takes our place in death's prison. In the deserts of our wanderings, he sustains us, giving us his body as manna for our weariness. The cup of suffering which he drank has become for us the cup of salvation. In his death, he ransomed us from death's dominion. In his resurrection, he opened the way to eternal life. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts that you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Lead us, O God, by the power of your Spirit to live as love commands. Bound to Christ, set us free for joyful obedience and glad service. As Jesus gave his life for ours, help us to live our lives for others. With humility and persistent courage, give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, 
in the Holy Church, now and forever. together in the prayer that our Savior taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of the rest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so whenever we eat this bread or drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. God of grace, your Son, Jesus Christ, left us this holy meal of bread and wine in which we share his body and blood. May we who have celebrated the sign of his great love show in our lives the fruits of his redemption. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. children of God because that is truly who you are, deeply loved, taught and led to change the world in Christ's name. I pray that you will go out and proclaim his love to everyone that you meet, to yourselves and to everyone that you meet. And I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, that he will cause his holy face to shine brightly upon you, and that he will fill you with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ may be so, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you.